The title is pretty self-explanatory. Out of all the anime I've watched and the manga I've read, which deaths made me cry? There is a small caveat to this, however. It counts that I've cried to a character's death no matter how old I was at the time. So if I saw a series when I was five and I cried at it, it still counts. So let's just get into it. Let's start off with a classic. Dragon Ball, more specifically Z. Whilst you did have moments in original Dragon Ball like Krillin's first death, which was pretty sad, and even with all the flack GT somehow still gets, Android 8's death was still pretty, really sad, but even more so with the added context of Android 8 as part in Goku's life as a kid. But those never really hit me the same way as some of the other deaths in the series do. It's kind of a basic answer, but Future Gohan's death really got to me, especially since I saw it when I was a kid. But even rewatching the special of the story of Future Trunks for the sake of this script, it got to me. Seeing him get absolutely rocked by the androids isn't the sad part. It's Trunks' reaction that gets to you. Just the music in the background sounding like sirens, Trunks gripping his hands in anguish, so tight his hands bleed while tears constantly stream down his face. It, it got to me, man. I'm, I'm a grown-ass man, but for some reason this scene got to me in a very particular way. It, it's always got to me. And what made it all the more sadder was how cool Future Gohan is. When he was the only fighter left, he kept fighting. He became a Super Saiyan, and he kept fighting. He lost his arm to save Trunks, and he kept fighting. And just hearing Gohan describe everyone's death to the androids and how that helped him become a Super Saiyan is cool and interesting. In his speech about how he knows that after he dies, he knows someone stronger than him, Trunks will take his place. It's cool. Unfortunately though, his entire death is kind of soured by the fact that when you get older, you realise that the future timeline doesn't make much sense at all, but in a vacuum, this scene is one of the hardest hitting in Dragon Ball. Made in Abyss is a dark series. No one will argue with that. But for some reason, which I can't explain, out of all the messed up things that happened in this series and all the weird stuff, the thing that got to me the most, in a, it just got a visual response from me, was this lovable, fluffy little fella, Markun. Basically, Markun is a creature that kind of just has the mind of a child and doesn't really know what they're doing. They're, they're genuinely the modern equivalent of Lenny from Mice and Men, but somehow more adorable than John Malkovich. We see Markun accidentally hurt the main character's pet, but the rules of this village they are now currently in dictate that if anything is broken or stolen, it must be replaced with something of equivalent value by the powers that oversee this village. Makes sense and it seems pretty fair, but the value of an object is dictated by its holder. So basically, the only thing that matters to this cute pink blob are its toys and more importantly, this little plush that gets ripped to shreds in front of them. Which in of itself is genuinely sad to watch to me. Hearing Markun cry makes me cry. But then after that, they still get ripped apart, losing an arm and a lot of the flesh on their face. And despite that fact, the only thing they're capable of saying is their own name, Ma. Markun still survives. They try to apologize for hurting the main character's pet and tries to make up despite the fact the only thing they can say being Ma. And they make up, it's nice. It, it's it's wholesome, it's good. But Ma Kun's story basically ends when Rico, the you know, character of Maiden Abyss, whose pet was injured by Ma, makes a plush to replace the one that the village took from Ma. They cry when recognizing their plush, and in the next shot, Ma vanishes. As the village they're from is destroyed, they also cease to exist. The reason this death genuinely made me sad is because it's literally just like, a kid who doesn't know any better being ripped to shreds for no reason and it literally them just ceasing to exist when they get their favorite plush back it, it's just sad man i don't know what it just makes it's genuinely sad for me to think about and i don't know why ah let's get happier with it let's go back to shonen hunter x hunter one of the gods of shonen which death out of the fair amount of deaths we see for a shonen which of them got to me on an emotional level was it meruem and komugi no, that was more of a bit sweet ending, and it wasn't just straight up sad. Was it Goto? Pretty cool character. Was a little sad when he died, but didn't really change much when he actually did die. And, I mean, he pretty much got replaced immediately, so it's whatever. Was it Netero? Nah, that stuff was just badass. That, Netero's death was sick. For me, what genuinely made me sad, it was Kite. Kite's death in the Chimera and arc kind of showed off how much the tone of this arc would be very different. I mean, Hunter Hunter always had dark moments before this, but I feel like this is one of the major moments that kind of showed how outmatched and outgunned the cast was in this arc going into it. We see Kite make his way through any Chimera ant in front of him with zero difficulty. 
Like, he destroys an entire herd of them with one swing, and also, he outclasses Nobunaga's ability that reaches a distance of 2 meters. And he extends it to 45. Like, dude is no joke. Then Pito shows up, and like most characters that encounter Pito, they kind of just get bodied. Kite losing an arm in the process and buying time for Gon and Killua to escape. That's not the sad part. The sad part isn't the shot of Pito holding Kite's lifeless head or Gon's straight up denial that Kite is dead and hugging the puppeteered corpse. No, it's just how dragged out this possibility of healing Kite is through the entire arc. The inevitability of Gon seeing the harshness of reality, it, it's just sad. When Kite initially dies, the audience is kind of like Gon in a sense for a little while. We know. Kite is dead from a logical standpoint, we know he was outgunned and missing an arm, and we see him as a severed head, but we have hope that it may be possible to heal Kite. I mean, we see his body Frankenstein together, however when we find out that there's no way for him to come back, I got sad, and Gorn snapped. Granted, the finality of this character's death is completely undercut by him coming back as a little girl, but hey, before we see little girl Kite, Kite's death hit both Gorn and me pretty hard. He was really cool. Let's jump into Berserk real quick. Berserk is kind of just filled with death, but there was one death in particular that hit me a lot harder than the others. Judo. Judo as a character is really cool and is one of the few characters who has remnants of himself throughout the entire series despite his death in the Golden Age arc which is relatively early on. What I mean by this is that even after his death during the Eclipse, Guts still walks around and uses what Judo taught him, wearing Judo's throwing knives with him through all the Black Swordsman arc and past that, till he gets the Berserk Rama, which I think is a nice little touch of depth to Guts' character design. But I went a bit off topic, so let's talk about Judo's death itself. During the Eclipse, we see pretty much every established character up to this point get ripped apart. Carcass, Pippin, Gaston, any named character besides Guts, Griffith, or Casca gets ripped to shreds. A lot of it is kind of off screen since we follow Guts's like journey through the Eclipse for the most part, but we get to see a slow, drawn out death for Judo. We see him struggle to protect Casca as he gets more and more injured, his arm getting eviscerated in the process. All the while he keeps shouting how they all need to fight to survive till the very end and not just simply give up and aim to have a warrior's death by simply fighting for the sake of fighting until he gets impaled protecting Casca and throws his last knife to kill a demon attacking the two of them. He gets carried away until he bleeds out and collapses before saying his last words. You cry a lot when you're alone, don't you Casca? <gasps> then, internally, he questions whether or not those were his actual last words and he dies. He dies not alone, but left with unrequited love as he sees all those he knows dear get butchered. I'd say that's pretty sad, but at least he didn't live long enough to see what would happen after that. Jojo is filled to the brim with death. I mean, each part has characters dying left, right and centre. If I make a part two to this, I'll probably end up talking about Jojo's a lot more, but for this I'll talk about just one death in particular. Every Jojo part has their respective groups. We have the Duan Gang, Bruno's group in Passion, and the most unfortunate group from Jojo is arguably the Stardust Crusaders. And one of the deaths from one of these unlucky fellas hit me the most, and it was Iggy. Iggy was a member that was there for the least amount of time, joining just before the fight with Endul's Geb, and inevitably helped in Endul's defeat. I mean, he's just a dog, but we can hear his internal dialogue and we can hear how much of a little piece of shit he is. But with the fight against Pet Shop, we see him lose his paw and keep going, killing Pet Shop, heading over to the Stardust Crusaders and letting them know the location of Dio's hideout. He is a useful ass dog. Sure is hell of a lot more useful than Danny. Even when they make it to Dio's hideout, he still helps them with the cream fight, in which he ultimately meets his end. He gets the life kicked out of him by Vanilla Ice to a gratuitous degree, but with his final breath, manages to save and sacrifice himself for Polnareff, to aid in him getting the final blow on Vanilla Ice. Then we see both his soul and Avdol's leave this mortal coil going into the clouds. The reason his death hit relatively hard is due to the fact that I like dogs, who doesn't? And on top of that he displayed the trait of a dog's loyalty perfectly protecting his homies even on his deathbed, but just the scene where Vanilla Ice is kicking the shit out of him is genuinely just kind of sad to watch. There was a little pattern 
for all of the characters in this list. Go in the comments and tell me what all these characters have in common, because each of them share a characteristic. Quickly go guess and type in the comments now, but the answer is coming in three, two, one. It was the fact that they all had an arm or a paw injured around or before their deaths. Gohan lost his arm to the androids, Markun lost his arm to the balancing but just grew theirs back because she's just built different I guess. Judo's arm was ripped to shreds in the Eclipse, Kite's arm was ripped off in the fight against Nefepito, and Iggy ripped off his paw in the fight against Pet Shop. Kinda cool. But to be honest, I only recognised this pattern after writing the script and like reading it over, which is kind of weird, but anyway, outro time. Hello, and thank you all for watching. Let me know what some of your deaths that made you cry are in the comments. I'm very intrigued to see what other people's deaths were that like made them get emotional. I'm curious. Feel free to like, comment, subscribe, join the Discord, follow on Patreon, Twitch, etc. You know the deal. P.S. The iceberg is getting closer to being done, but by the looks of it, it's going to be the longest video I've ever made, but like about 40 minutes long or so, so it's, it's, it's in the pipeline, let's say that much. Just cut me some slack. Also, thank you to Chris and Tribal on the Patreon. Cheers, fellas. A shorter outro here, but with that being said, toodles my doodles, I'll see you in the next one. Peace.